fisherman was hauling up his cray pots. He had seen whales before, but this one took his breath away. It was twice the length of his boat. Beneath the water's surface, it glowed a luminous blue. The fisherman's encounter was the beginning of a remarkable journey. Australia's southern coastline has been exposed to battering seas. Perilous and unforgiving, these waters have defied most attempts to demystify their depths. But when whale biologist Peter Gill heard of fishermen sighting blue whales, he had to investigate and started looking for them in 1998. Oh, I was really excited. The first day that we got to Discovery Bay, we found 30 blue whales, and that's pretty extraordinary. The blue whale is the largest animal in the history of our planet. Longer than two buses, it has a heart the size of a small car, and its tongue alone weighs as much as an African elephant. Yet in spite of its enormity, it remains elusive. Slaughtered by whalers until protected in 1965, it's one of the world's most endangered mammals. For Pete Gill, seeing these big blues feeding meant something extraordinary was happening. So I rang an oceanographer and asked him what might be happening in this area that might attract giant predators. And he said, oh, well, that's where the bonnie upwelling is and I'd never heard of the Bonnie Upwelling. And that's what got me going. The Bonnie Upwelling is an annual cold current off Australia's southeast coast. Cold Antarctic water creeps northward across the ocean floor carrying a flow of minerals and organic matter that's accumulated in its depths. When summer winds hit the seas, these nutrient-rich waters upwell from the bottom, like a massive upside-down waterfall. With sunlight, life explodes. Phytoplankton multiplies, turning the ocean green. These tiny plants are food for krill, small prawn-like crustaceans that swarm in their billions. Fish and seabirds home in to feast on krill, and penguins and fur seals dive for fish. They all benefit from the bonny upwelling. It's early summer, eight years since Pete Gill started exploring the waters of the Bonnie Coast. New Zealand fur seals herald the beginning of the upwelling. Bulls congregate where females, or cows, have gathered and battle to keep their territories. The upwelling season attracts marine life and scientists alike. These scientists share Pete Gill's fascination with what's unfolding in the waters. Fur seals could help provide them with some answers, and conveniently, they breed on land.
About seven days after pupping, the female will mate again with a bull of her choice. Soon she'll be pregnant, as well as caring for a growing pup. Time to head out to sea to find food. The scientists are keen to know exactly where and when the mothers feed. A group led by Dr. Simon Goldsworthy is catching females with older pups. They anesthetize the mother and measure her. Then attach a tracking device that, with the help of a satellite, can locate her out at sea. When this mum returns to feed her pup, she will be a treasure trove of information. Occasionally they beat the odd birds, they had little penguins and shearwaters, sometimes crustaceans as well. So mainly small pelagic fish, but also uh, squid. So they have a pretty diverse diet. So far, the cow seals are confirming the lure of the upwelling. The adult females feed down towards the Bonny Coast. When those upwelling events are very strong, that's where you find concentrations of the foods that fur seals consume. With the start of summer, Pete Gill is taking the first of his many boat trips of the season in search of his beloved blue whales. After nearly a decade of research, his passion for these giants is unabated and he still has more questions than he does answers. If you're looking at conserving such an endangered species, we've got to try and understand how many there are, where they are, how they move around, why they go to certain areas. So it's a giant jigsaw puzzle. We've got a very important part in front of us out here. On his way out to sea, Pete passes a colony of Australasian gannets. They're feasting on fish that are gathering in the upwelling. Lawrence Rocks is the largest gannet colony in Australia. In early summer, the population swells. This is breeding time and observing elaborate courtship customs as part of the annual ritual. Fisheries officer Charlie Cooper is back at Lawrence Rocks after two years away. He's surprised to find himself in the midst of a land grab. I was amazed about the the growth in the population. Just every little available space is taken up with gannets. At this time of year, the gannets are usually sitting on their eggs, but Charlie finds that some chicks have already hatched. Birds may be breeding earlier because of the competition for space. The most experienced birds are getting set up and getting on with it maybe two months before they were in, say, ten years ago. The gannets are coming home after fishing. With the skies and the ground below so congested, inexperienced birds can sometimes land in the wrong nest and face the wrath of its occupants. Space is at a premium, and many of the first-time breeders are pushed to the edges of the colony. Others are taking a stab at nest building for the first time, with varying degrees of success. Clearly, this technique needs working on.
Pete's primary goal at this stage is to observe blue whales feeding on krill. He's chartered a spotter plane to radio whale sightings back to his boat. Whale spotted a pelican. Whale spotted a pelican. Do you receive? Over. Go ahead, over. Uh, Pete, we're, we're sitting above a, a whale that's just submerged. We're waiting for it to uh, uh, come to the surface again. Single whale. Oh, here it comes. Uh, I'll give you the uh, location on that, Pete. The whale is only a few kilometres away, but blues can travel at speeds of up to 30 knots. The yacht is racing to catch up. They're greyhounds of the sea. They're these big, long, lean things that can lope along, cover great distances. It just makes it very difficult to estimate how many they are, where they are. About 20 degrees to port. There's two whales, a little more. Can you see them? By the time okay. they near the whale, it's found a companion. Get ahead now. We're going west at the moment. The quiet yacht doesn't disturb the whales, but it's slow. It soon becomes clear that Pete can't achieve a close encounter. I think we'll just have to let them go. They're obviously yeah. on their way somewhere. It's disappointing, but not surprising, considering the whale's impressive speed. To travel so quickly, they burn a huge amount of energy, and they don't have much in reserve. They have quite thin blubber, so they need to consume tons of food a day. They have to trade off the energy they burn in searching for food for the amount of energy they obtain from the food that they find. So they're probably on a bit of a knife edge. Pete's on a bit of a knife edge too, hoping to find blue whales feeding. The spotter plane calls in again. We've got a large female blue whale here and a calf uh, feeding in clear water. Uh, look, there's the calf, that's beautiful. There you can see it. Um, is there any krill visible at that location, Lava? Yes, we've got surface krill here. What's the position there, Lava? Uh, waypoint. Oh, look, there's the lunch. There's the feeding lunch. Whoa! Yeah. Uh, sensational. The guys in the plane have just witnessed a truly rare event, and Pete can't hide his frustration. With bad weather setting in and no more calls from the plane, he calls it quits on his first trip of the season. He hoped for something better. On his way back to port, Pete comes across local fisherman Neil O'Connell. Pete and Neil often swap information about the Big Blue's whereabouts. Oh, we're just chasing them all day today. They were on the move, they were diving deep. Yeah. But Neil's had better luck. Oh, OK, straight up to the west. Oh, yeah? How far? Uh, about two miles. OK. They come right past us. Really? Gee, you were lucky. That was good. That's the closest change ever made. Yeah. yeah. Very good. OK, see ya. See ya. It's a blow for Pete but local fishermen know these waters better than he ever could. The fishermen I know are really proud of the fact that there's these big blue whales out there. In the first season, I got about a third of all sightings were reported by the fishermen. These people have spent all their lives here and have a really deep sense of what's out there. On the wharf in Portland, Bill Tober is one fisherman who's spent his life on these waters. Oh, I suppose I've been fishing since I was in nappies. Bill's loading bait for a two-week crayfishing trip. And when you steam down the coast and you're thinking in your mind, I'll go fishing here or I'll go fishing there, and you look at the water temperature and about 55 other factors come into it, you say, well, we'll go here and have a look. And, and that's how you build your knowledge, and of course that changes each year, which is very hard to explain even to a scientist. The town of Portland owes its existence to the seasonally rich waters. In 
In its early days, southern right whales and fur seals were the primary industry. By the 1900s, the town had turned to fishing after the whales and seals were nearly annihilated. Fur seals have had much more success in recovering from the slaughter. Today, on Lady Julia Percy Island, the Australian fur seal population is now over 20,000. This colony is in the best position. It's the closest to the upwelling. These two-month-old pups are still too young to swim. They play and sleep at the water's edge, anticipating their mum's return. When the cows finally do come ashore, they bellow loudly to attract their offspring. Amazingly, in the midst of the chaos, each pup recognises its mum. It's a joyous, if deafening, reunion. But very soon, it's down to business. The mums have been at sea for days, and their pups are famished. Mothers have little rest. After only a few days on shore, they must leave to go fishing again. In the evening, little penguins march ashore, exhausted by their day's fishing trip. They've been diving as many as 500 times, often as far down as 30 metres, chasing small fish in the upwell. Now, with their bellies full, they have to waddle their way up the cliffs, running the gauntlet of curious pups. Inside their burrows, their mates are waiting with hungry chicks. They announce their return with a raucous braying. Clearly on Lady Julia Percy Island, the arrival of food is worth celebrating. While the chick is young, the parents take turns babysitting. By morning, one of them will have gone to sea to find more fish. It's a glorious day, and Pete is embarking on his next research trip, this time with colleague Margie Maurice. Like Pete, Margie's primary focus is the blue whale's hunting and feeding patterns. My main interest are to try and identify where the blue whales are feeding and how they approach, behave and feed on their prey, which are the krill, and how krill respond to a big, huge blue whale coming to feed on them. Margie spots a large flock of shearwaters, or mutton birds. Each year, around 23 million shearwaters fly from the Arctic to Australia's southeast waters, a trip of over 15,000 kilometres. They come to breed and feed on the huge swarms of krill. Oh, 
What's special about cruel in this area is that there's so much of it. In a good season when the upwelling's really pumping, we'll end up with vast areas covered with these swarms of krill. Some of them might be more than a kilometre long. It's a lot harder to study krill than it is to study blue whales because the krill will migrate vertically. You might see them near the surface one day. Hours later, you can go back through the same area. No krill at the surface. All the fundamental questions about krill are unanswered. How much there is, exactly what they eat, whether their whole cycle is tied to the upwelling. Krill's a very mysterious animal. Unlike other species, the krill found on the Bonny coast spends a lot of time on or near the surface. This makes it easier for Pete and Margie to study its hugest predator. Blue whales probably eat between three and four tonnes of food a day. So usually if you find large swarms of krill, there's a blue whale not too far away. Soon afterwards, Pete's proven right. They are elated to have their first close encounter of the season. taking photos for identifying blue whales. They have this fantastic pigmentation pattern which is individual to each whale. So that whole mixture of their pigment and their dorsal fin shape and the size of the animal itself all bring this picture of who they are. Pete is excited. He suspects that this whale may be one he photographed back on the very first day he sailed in 1998. A comparison confirms his hunch. It's their first conclusive proof that blues visit the Bonnie Coast in more than one year. Margie's photos will be sent to other whale tracking teams around the world. So far, marine scientists have no idea where the blues come from or where they go when they leave the coast. If they're a jigsaw puzzle, as Pete suggests, then most of the pieces are missing. Everything is a valuable clue. And that means everything. close to the whale than their poo, really, in terms of knowing what they've eaten. It's very smelly, but it's got a great scientific benefit to us. They've got an awfully big mouth. They're getting a lot more than just the swarms of krill. So that's of great interest to us as to what makes up that bycatch. And then we build up a much better picture of what helps feed the whales. Oh, yeah, that's good. Great. You really have to get out there. You have to be out on the water, you have to be in the elements. And any occasion you see them and collect information from them is really important. Whales are difficult to study as they don't spend much time on the surface. But when they dive, they create an eddy known by scientists as a footprint. And the start of another trail of scientific information. Oh, there was some skin there in the water. There is a very new study in using skin that comes off as it's swimming along. 
just drive, yeah, let's just drive through that foot. We're hoping that skin might give us some genetic information about the individual whale, the population as a whole, and also might get closer to understanding how well they're recovering. Oh no, good. Hey, there we go. Yeah, look at us. We actually don't get to see much of the animal itself apart from the top of the whale and all that sort of information about what sex they are is underneath. So the skin's one of the only ways we can identify if it's a male or a female. Margie and Pete are keen to understand the social life of these whales. Often we see them solitary, but they're not solitary animals. You might see a blue whale just off by itself feeding, but we believe that they spend a lot of their time in pairs. Whales use their infrasonic voices to communicate with each other across hundreds of kilometres. The blues call averages 155 decibels. That's the equivalent of being less than a metre from a jet engine at full throttle. They don't mate, they don't form pairs like humans do, but they may just have companion animals that they prefer to go hunting with. Hopefully we'll start to understand some of those relationships as well. Pete and Margie still haven't achieved their goal of seeing a blue whale feeding. As the season progresses, the whales are disappearing because the krill is staying deep below the surface. We have stopped here in the area where we saw a lot of krill and the krill is at a, in a continuous layer at about 40 metres. So it looks like the krill that we saw at the surface has gone down in the water. Pete suspects that the mild summer is affecting the upwelling. This is the um, infrared satellite image showing sea surface temperature, but the blue water is cold and the green water is warmer. And that's where we've been finding the whales along that front. This season it's been fairly quiet and we're not seeing a lot out here. It hasn't been a strong upwelling year. Although the season started out with promise, the strong southeasterly winds that drive the upwelling have failed to materialise. That means less krill and fewer blue whales. It also spells disaster for other dependents of the upwelling. In the middle of the season, penguins are starving to death. Fledging chicks hover on the brink. They wait for parents who never return with the nourishment they so desperately need. There may not be enough fish this year, or the fish could simply be swimming too deep. Unlike the penguins, the Australian fur seals are flourishing. Much more equipped for these conditions, they can dive to 200 metres for food and travel for weeks if necessary. Their pups, now three months old, are learning to swim. Scientist Simon Goldsworthy knows that this is a critical stage in their life cycle. When mums are sure over the course of a day and a half, they can consume two to three litres of milk and they basically fill up like balloons. But they need to because the fasting period, which may extend over four days to a week or more, is when they also have to develop the skills required to become foragers once they wean. These pups won't be weaned for another seven months. Then they'll leave the island to fend for themselves. Fish aren't always easy to find, especially in a weak upwelling season. On Lawrence Rocks, the gannet chicks are also pleading for food. At three months, they're as big as their parents and have an adult appetite. The more experienced parents can still keep up the supply, but not everyone is so fortunate. 
The birds that bred later can't find enough fish, and their offspring must go hungry. With bellies full, these older chicks are strengthening their wings for their very first flight. Mum and Dad make it look so easy. Timing is everything in the inaugural takeoff. These cliffs are over six stories high, and the smallest mistake can be deadly. This chick is too impatient. Sadly, it won't survive its fall. All the young gannets will eventually leave the rocks and head out to sea. 4,000 inexperienced hunters will rely on the riches of a strong upwelling. And this year, they may not find what they need. But strangely, while many Bonnie Coast residents struggle to survive, this season has seen a bumper crop of southern bluefin tuna. Each summer, juvenile tuna migrate from deep oceanic waters to the rich southern coast. Voracious hunters, they feast on fish until they double in size. Southern bluefins swim in large schools and can prove a very lucrative catch. Satellite imagery and spotter planes are employed to pinpoint their location. Here, young tuna have come to the surface to socialize and sun themselves. The fishermen throw pilchards to keep the school in place while they tow a huge net around them. join the net to a large sea cage and herd the tuna inside. This catch is around 50 ton. That's $2 million worth of fish. But the tuna are being caught far to the west of the Bonnie Upwelling. And that means there must be another source of fertile water. What marine scientists now realize is that the Bonnie Upwelling forms one part of a much larger system. The newly discovered Flinders Current starts to the south of Australia and runs westward along the continental slope. All along the coast, huge submarine canyons slice into the continental shelf, funneling nutrient-rich water. These submarine canyons are nearly 5,000 meters deep, deeper than North America's Grand Canyon. Although the Bonnie upwelling remains the richest, smaller upwellings are being discovered all along the Flinders Current. And that's what accounts for the tuna hotspot. It also explains why, in the other direction, Portland's Bill Tober is catching bigger crayfish. They do grow a lot quicker because there's a lot more water flow there, which is to do with the currents coming through from the sub-Antarctic, bringing the feed, not directly for the craze, but the plankton and the krill feed everything else that just keeps the system going. Bill's lucky. 
He's one of a handful of fishermen who has a license to fish in these fertile waters. Basically, you can catch in a week what some boats will catch in a year. It's to do with what they eat. With news of these other smaller upwellings, Peter's now widening his search for blue whales along the Flinders Current. He's heading west by air towards the tuna feeding grounds. Within moments of arriving, Pete's amazed to see whales feeding on krill just below the surface. Clearly, the whales' feeding grounds are much larger than he suspected, over a thousand kilometres along Australia's southern coast. This raises another important question. With such a huge area to cover, how do the whales track down the krill? Maybe they can smell phytoplankton on the air when they surface to breathe. Memory had come into it a lot. They'd know where they'd found a lot of food in the past. Maybe they use their ears and hear the zillions of little krill legs all clicking away. We don't know how they find food. A lot of unanswered questions. Back on the Bonnie coast, there's finally a change in the weather. Late in the season, the southeast winds are blowing, revitalizing the upwell. It's too windy for terns to fish at sea, so they take time out on the shore. With the signs now looking more hopeful, Pete and Margie take their last boat trip of the season. Pete's not feeling too confident. In the past, he's seen up to 60 blues per season, but this summer his total is less than 30. The Southern Hemisphere was the great stronghold of blue whales. There were probably somewhere around a quarter of a million a hundred years ago, and they were really hammered to the point of extinction. As far as we know, they're still just hanging on. Small shifts in the weather and the upwelling can be of concern, but Pete and Margie really worry that blue whales won't survive a major climate change. But for now, big swarms of krill are an encouraging sign. A flock of gannets and dolphins leads the boat into a frenzy of feeding. Dolphins push fish to the surface where the gannets can target them with pinpoint precision. It's a dance to the death between predator and prey. A common sight in normal years, but Pete and Margie haven't seen any feeding frenzies this year. It's not long before Pete spots a plume of spray. At last they're in luck, a blue whale feeding. Oh, it's amazing when they feed. They're such huge, powerful animals. And they will drive themselves into this krill. They open their mouth wide and they shove the ocean into their throat.
They have these pleats like a skirt that allow their entire throat to hold between 50 and 100 tonnes of water and krill. And for a few minutes, they're just like this giant tadpole just lying there in the ocean. And they pump the water out through their baleen, the mouth left slightly open. Krill stays inside and then they resume their beautiful streamlined shape and off they go for another feed. This is the moment they've been striving for all season. To witness the battle for survival between the largest predator on the planet and its tiny but feisty prey. Krill just doesn't sit there waiting to be eaten. Each individual krill is an individual animal that desperately doesn't want to be eaten. But they can move quite quickly sometimes. I've seen a blue whale actually change its attack halfway through a lunge. It's sort of twisted to one side to follow the movement of krill that was desperately trying to get out of the way. It's quite a dynamic and exciting thing. It's not just these big vacuum cleaners mindlessly hoovering around in the ocean. They're these alert predators. The Bonny Coast is one of only a handful of places on Earth where blue whales are known to feed. This remarkable spectacle is a rare privilege. The bonny upwelling is a real treasure. Nothing illustrates that better than the fact that it's a blue whale feeding area because blue whales have to go to areas where there's a lot to eat because they're just such giant predators. They need that food in abundance. Every summer, the waters off the Bonny Coast pulses with fertility. It nourishes countless forms of marine life, including the largest predator of all. And with the blue whale population so precarious, the Bonny upwelling is of global significance to its survival. Pete Gill's research tells him that blue whales have been migrating to the Bonny Coast for many thousands of years. But where do they come from? And where do they go when the season ends? Pete hopes further research will answer these questions. But for now, only the blue whales know. Majestic, luminous, Enormous. The blue whale is every bit as mysterious as the depths from which it came. It was an early summer morning off the southeast coast of Australia in 1995. A fisherman was hauling up his cray pot. He'd seen whales before, but this one took his breath away. It was twice the length of his boat. 
Beneath the water's surface, it glowed a luminous blue. The fisherman's encounter was the beginning of a remarkable journey. For millions of years, Australia's southern coastline has been exposed to battering seas. Perilous and unforgiving, these waters have defied most attempts to demystify their depths. But when whale biologist Peter Gill heard of fishermen sighting blue whales, he had to investigate and started looking for them in 1998. Oh, I was really excited. The first day that we got to Discovery Bay, we found the 30 blue whales, and that's pretty extraordinary. The blue whale is the largest animal in the history of our planet. Longer than two buses, it has a heart the size of a small car, and its tongue alone weighs as much as an African elephant. Yet in spite of its enormity, it remains elusive. Slaughtered by whalers until protected in 1965, it's one of the world's most endangered mammals. For Pete Gill, seeing these big blues feeding meant something extraordinary was happening. So I rang an oceanographer and asked him what might be happening in this area that might attract giant predators. And he said, oh, well, that's where the bonnie upwelling is and I'd never heard of the Bonnie Upwelling. And that's what got me going. The Bonnie Upwelling is an annual cold current off Australia's southeast coast. Cold Antarctic water creeps northward across the ocean floor carrying a flow of minerals and organic matter that's accumulated in its depths. When summer winds hit the seas, these nutrient-rich waters upwell from the bottom, like a massive upside-down waterfall. With sunlight, life explodes. Phytoplankton multiplies, turning the ocean green. These tiny plants are food for krill, small prawn-like crustaceans that swarm in their billions. Fish and seabirds home in to feast on krill, and penguins and fur seals dive for fish. They all benefit from the bonny upwelling. It's early summer, eight years since Pete Gill started exploring the waters of the Bonnie Coast. New Zealand fur seals herald the beginning of the upwelling. Bulls congregate where females, or cows, are gathered and battle to keep their territories. The upwelling season attracts marine life and scientists alike. These scientists share Pete Gill's fascination with what's unfolding in the waters. Fur seals could help provide them with some answers, and conveniently, they breed on land. About seven days after pupping, the female will mate again with a bull of her choice. Soon she'll be pregnant, as well as caring for a growing pup. Time to head out to sea to find food. The scientists are keen to know exactly where and when the mothers feed. The group, led by Dr. Simon Goldsworthy, is catching females with older pups.
They anesthetize the mother and measure her. Then attach a tracking device that, with the help of a satellite, can locate her out at sea. When this mum returns to feed her pup, she will be a treasure trove of information. Great. Occasionally they beat the odd birds, they had little penguins and shearwaters, sometimes crustaceans as well. So mainly small pelagic fish but also uh, squid. So they have a pretty diverse diet. So far, the cow seals are confirming the lure of the upwelling. The adult females feed down towards the Bonny Coast. When those upwelling events are very strong, that's where you find concentrations of the foods that fur seals consume. With the start of summer, Pete Gill is taking the first of his many boat trips of the season in search of his beloved blue whales. After nearly a decade of research, his passion for these giants is unabated, and he still has more questions than he does answers. If you're looking at conserving such an endangered species, we've got to try and understand how many there are, where they are, how they move around, why they go to certain areas. So it's a giant jigsaw puzzle. We've got a very important part of in front of us out here. On his way out to sea, Pete passes a colony of Australasian gannets. They're feasting on fish that are gathering in the upwelling. Lawrence Rocks is the largest gannet colony in Australia. In early summer, the population swells. This is breeding time, and observing elaborate courtship customs is part of the annual ritual. Fisheries officer Charlie Cooper is back at Lawrence Rocks after two years away. He's surprised to find himself in the midst of a land grab. I was amazed about the, the growth in the population. Just every little available space is taken up with gannets. At this time of year, the gannets are usually sitting on their eggs. But Charlie finds that some chicks have already hatched. Birds may be breeding earlier because of the competition for space. The most experienced